Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. I want to welcome you to our services. Let's stand together, please. And we're going to st start out today, January the 4th, Independence Day, Independence Sunday, America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful, oh, spacious skies, oh,
like that song. If you look at the screen with me this morning, we are reading through the book of Psalms, and we are today in <laughs> Psalm chapter number 39. So let's read this as unto the Lord this morning. I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle, while the wicked are before me. I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor, Selah. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When the rebukes, you correct me. You make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is vapor, Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears. For I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Remove your gaze from me that I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Go ahead and greet one another in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at this time our junior church can be dismissed. Well, amen. It's good to see you this morning, and we want to welcome you to the services of the church on this uh, 4th of July. This is uh, Independence Day. I was uh, talking with my wife this morning, and we were sharing a couple thoughts that uh, we celebrate July 4th as Independence Day. But if I think I've got this right, if I don't, you can let me know later. But I believe that the vote for Independence Day was actually on July the 2nd. And that's when they said, hey, yes, we're going to be the independent land. And they began signatures on July the 4th. And then I learned something today that I did not know, that all the signatures were complete. I believe it was by August the 2nd. They had to be able to gather everybody around to sign that document that we know as the Declaration of Independence today. So, interesting little tidbit. I'm glad you're here. We want to welcome you. We have several announcements that we want to make this morning, so let me get right into these. Um, do want to remind you about Vacation Bible School. That's VBS. The theme this year is Destination Dig. And uh, we want you to join us this Wednesday, if you can, if you're helping out with that, if you're working with Vacation Bible School, if you want to help with Vacation Bible School, Join us this Wednesday as we continue in preparations for Destination Dig, and that begins, it takes place, they start at 4 o'clock, and they end up, uh, let's see, 4 o'clock, they have a meal together here around the supper time hour, and uh, right about till 7 or 8 o'clock, I believe it is, some come up for our Wednesday night Bible study, and, uh, but we'd love to have you take part in that. Also want to remind those folks, if you have yet to... Follow the Lord in believer's baptism. You know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that first step of obedience, that next step, believer's baptism, if you have yet to do that, we're going to be hosting a baptism class here 
next Sunday at uh, 9.45 a.m. It'll be meeting in the White Building. That's the Christian Ed Building right behind this one. And we'll be meeting in what we call the Red Room over there. So if you would like to be a part of that, we have a lesson handout we'll be giving to everybody. We want you to understand what Believer's Baptism is all about. I've always been of this belief. If somebody is in conversation and with a friend and the friend says, hey, guess what I did? What did you do? I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Well, that's wonderful. Hey, guess what somebody said? What? You need to be baptized. Oh, why? Well, because our pastor said so. That, to me, that doesn't hold the weight that the scriptures do. The word of God teaches us why each of us as believers are to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. So we'll be having a class for that. Next Sunday, that's July the 11th at 9.45 a.m. Also, again, want to remind you about our church picnic. Please put that on your calendar. Highlight that. That's going to be Saturday, July 17th at Colt State Park in Bristol, Rhode Island. And we'll be meeting there starting at 10 o'clock. Now, we need you to pray because I'm not sure if we want to have that 94, 95 degree weather in the hot sun. I'm certainly sure we don't want to have the deluge of rain we've just had the last couple of days. That won't go well with a picnic. So we're asking God somehow find us this happy medium between the real hot, 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 hot and the real wet, 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 wet. So if we can get that, that would be a wonderful thing. Beverages and watermelon will be provided by our church family. Oh, I should say by our church for each of our families coming out. Uh, you can bring either a hot lunch with you if you want to cook something, prepare to do that, or cold lunch with you. And also, we'd like you to bring something else, and I simply call it a desire for Christian fellowship, and we're looking forward to doing that together. All right, let's see. At this time, let's pray, and then we're going to go right into our communion service. If you have your Bible handy, or you can use the Bible in the pew in front of you, we'll be looking at, just briefly, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 beginning in verse number 23. But before we do, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come today. Father, thank you for each one that's come for to worship today, Lord. We ask and pray that you'd speak to our hearts from your word. And God, as we go into this time of communion, we are mindful of so many things that you have provided for us, that you have done for us. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have in our offerings that we receive today in this plate in the front and the plate in the rear. God, that you would take the gifts that we give today out of the abundance of what you have already given to us and that you might bless them and break them and deliver them out to the multitude, that the gospel might continue to go forth from this place. Father, as we look into your word at this time of communion, may we examine our own lives. Father, might we continue to walk with you as we need to walk and to live for you as we need to live. Bless us, work in us that you might work through us, and we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and beginning in verse 23, for I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So this morning in front of you, there'll be a little element for the Lord's table, and in this is the wafer bread and the juice. And so if you want to peel back that top, remember when Jesus gave thanks, he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brother Lenny, would you pray, please? Amen. 
they took the bread and they did eat. The Bible says, in the same manner, they also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Tom, would you pray, please? They took the cup and ate it up. Now the Bible tells us that after they ate and after they drank at the Lord's table, he sang a hymn. We're going to sing the first part of a song. It's in our hymn books entitled, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. <clears throat> Let's be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred mind is like to Well, now that we've prepared our hearts to the Lord's table, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. And want to share something. Oh, I'm sorry. Take your Bibles and turn there, but before we do, thank you, Pam. She's going to sing a special song for us. You know what? And I have that written down, too. Oh, my goodness. But he didn't forget the kids. Good morning and happy Independence Day. It is such a privilege to get to sing this song because I will tell you since I was a little girl, I've always thought lucky I was to be born in America. I remember the little cardboard boxes that you would put change in for the missionaries. And I would look at the pictures of all the kids from these different lands and think, wow, I am so lucky. And now that I'm an adult and I understand that Jesus died for me and that I'm saved, and that's really what freedom is. I know that I'm really blessed, and so are you. So if you could please stand with me for the singing of our national anthem. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets rang the bombs burst. Gave proof through 
be seated. Thank you, Pam. Now, aren't you glad I didn't forget, Pam? <laughs> oh, amen. Philippians chapter number one in your Bibles. I was thinking, you know, sometimes we bring these, uh, I call them thematic messages. You know, it's uh, Mother's Day, speak, you know, geared toward moms, Father's Day, different times, and uh, July 4th, you know, Independence, and we've done that patriotic message. And I asked the Lord, Lord, if this was the last message I was to bring before you called me home, what would it be? Should it be 4th of July? Should I do that? Or what would you have me to do? And I kept coming back to this passage in Philippians chapter 1. Now I'm praying that this isn't the last message, you know, that God will have me to bring. Um, I'm all ready to go. I'm just not ready to leave. Amen? And so when God calls me, fine. But, you know, I like to kind of hang out with the with the brothers and sisters a while longer. But in Philippians chapter number 1, I'm going to pick up with you this morning in verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. So if we could springboard off a text verse this morning in this passage, it would be, we'll start from verse number 27. And Paul reminds us of something very, very important here. And he starts out by saying to us, let your conduct, your manner of living, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And Paul writing to the church of Philippi and these Philippian believers that he loved and, and who shared with him and, and cared for him. And, and it wasn't always, they, they, he, remember in Acts chapter 16, there was a little bit of difficulty when he first came into relationship with them in that area. But how it's turned out to be so sweet and wonderful. And, and there are many commentators that refer to this book of Philippians as the warmest letter that Paul ever writes demonstrating his affection for these brothers and sisters in Christ. But in verse number 27, Paul reminds us to let your conduct, your manner of living, be worthy of the gospel. And that's what I want to build around this morning, the fact that we might be each and every single day striving together, living together, serving together for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody once asked this question, they said, and I know I've posed this to you before, I've posed it to myself often, that if you were placed on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you in a court of law? And, and that's a really sobering thought. The conduct we give, the way we live, the manner of life that we live in Christ, if we were brought into the courtroom, could they say, this man, this woman, yes, charges against them, guilty for being a Christian, a Christ follower, a believer in Jesus Christ, and they lay out all the evidence before us. So Paul reminds these at Philippi that it's very important that the testimony that they have, it's very important that the example they give is right. And as I read this, I started to think, you know what? This is the word of God from God for me and you for today. If Paul is writing an inspiration of, the, uh, the inspiration of God, this, this gospel message, this message to the Philippians then, that it was so important that in the time and the place that they live, that their testimony be right and their example for God be right. How much more for you and me today? The same should be true of us. Amen. That as Christians, as children of God, as Christ followers, that we exhibit the testimony that, that demonstrates, it shows, yes, there's the evidence. They're a believer in Jesus. 
There's the example. They seek to live the life that God has called them to live. So there's three things I'd like to share with you briefly this morning concerning this striving together for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. First thing is this. There is a conduct that's expected of every one of us as believers. There is a manner of living that God expects of each of us. You say, how do you know? Because it's in the very book that you're holding. It comes from the very word of God that we read. Our conduct that Paul speaks of has not only to do with what we say as a believer, but it's interesting, it also has to do how we are seen as a believer. How people look at us. What people think about us. Paul is saying that there is a certain manner of life that is expected of those who profess Jesus Christ not only as their Savior, but there's a certain manner of life that's expected of each of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord of our life. That means he, he has the, the vested interest in every single one of us today, right here, right now, today, where we live. So there's a couple of things we see in this encouragement from Paul about this conduct. And first of all, we'd say this conduct is befitting uh, for the believer. It's befitting for you and me as children of God. The word conduct is a political word. Isn't that interesting in the day and time in which we live? The word conduct is a political word. It's a word that is descriptive of a citizen. A citizen. It was a word that believers at Philippi would quickly associate with and, and, and quickly understand. For Philippi was a Roman colony. And you remember reading back, doing your own Bible studies, that Roman colonies were these little bits of Rome that were planted throughout the then known world. And in these colonies, the citizens living in these colonies were expected to act as Romans. They spoke the language of Rome. They wore the dress of Rome. They handled all their affairs, personal, private, public affairs, as Romans, even though they were a long way from Rome. So what is Paul saying as he starts out here? I think this is very valuable for you and for me. What Paul is saying to them is, you know how the citizens of Rome live, and you know how the citizens of Rome act. As a believer, consider how this applies to you. As a citizen of heaven, how are you supposed to live here? How are you supposed to behave here? How are you supposed to act here as a citizen of heaven? See, one of the things we note about Rome, Rome was always at the ready, right? They were always at the ready. I mean, they were always at the ready to, for, for military strength. They were always at the ready for, for political situation, everything. They were always at the ready. And it's interesting how this Roman colony, how Paul seemingly in the scripture ties this together. As Rome was always at the ready, such should be true of you and me as believers. See, that all falls in line what Paul is saying in the very beginning about their testimony and their example for Christ being demonstrated to their then known world. And as believers, we are in this world, but not of this world. That's a given. We get that. We understand that. But we also need to know that our citizenship is in heaven, and the life that we now live should be that of a kingdom citizen here on earth. We are called to live the life of a kingdom citizen, a representative of the heavenly home that's waiting for us one day when we get to be with Jesus. So the church then is what? The church becomes an outpost. It's an outpost on earth. And we should live as citizens of that heavenly settlement or that heavenly outpost. So what Paul says, first of all, is, is this is a conduct that's befitting of a believer. Secondly, it's a conduct that's becoming of a believer. In verse 27 in our text this morning, he begins here, Only let your conduct be worthy, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. What is he saying? Well, a believer, a Christian, is to live a life that's worthy of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, there's a lot of bad news going on in the world today. 
But you and I as a Christian, we are to live lives that are worthy of the good news. So no matter what's happening in the world around us, no matter what's imploding, no matter what decisions are being made out there by powers and higher authority that you might not agree with or that I might not agree with, as a Christian, we can say, wow, yeah, that's tough. That is bad news. But let me tell you, I got some good news to tell you. And I think that's how the disciples back then, that's how those in the early church turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. There was a lot of bad stuff going on. But they came out and, and, and came out from where they met and went into the highways and the hedges, remember? And they promoted the Lord Jesus. They promoted the gospel of Christ. While all the bad news is going on around them, they promoted the good news. And, and I'm afraid we don't do that enough. Yes, we can agree. There's a lot of bad stuff, I think, even going on in our own country. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of strife. Okay, I get it. I see it. The media has always got it before me. But as a child of God, what am I to do? Do I hunker down? Do I hide like an ostrich with a head in the sand? Or do I look at this world in which we live, this America that Pam just sang about, and say, well, wait a minute. While all that's going on around us, I've got some good news. And that is that Jesus still loves this world. That Jesus still loves sinners. That Jesus died on the cross for everybody. And he wants to use me. He wants to use you to be a voice to that point. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul said, I therefore, by the, the prisoner of our, the Lord, beseech you. This word beseech, I beg you, Paul said to the church at Ephesus. I beg you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Remember them? In Colossians 1.10, Paul said of them that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Oh God, help us to be worthy of the call, the walk that you placed upon our life. It's interesting, the word worthy was used to describe the balancing of a scale. What do I mean by that? Well, if one wanted to measure an ounce of gold back in that day, they would place on one side of the scale what was called the standard that weighed an ounce. They had that measured out. They knew that standard weighed one ounce, one true ounce. And they would put that on one side of the scale. They would then put their gold on the other side of the scale, and when the scale balanced out, they knew they had one true ounce of gold. Nobody cheating them. And there is a standard by which we must measure our lives. But let me also remind us of this real quick before we press on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says this, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Our standard isn't to take ourselves as Christians, to take the church as the body of Christ and seek to measure it up against the world, the entertainment of the world, the pleasures of the world, the excitement of the world, everything the world has to offer. That's not our standard. Our standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to measure ourselves to him. And with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, we then seek to live up to that standard. Amen. Do you see that? Do you see that? Even as Christians, we have to be careful that we don't measure ourselves against the wrong standard. We're not to measure ourselves against one another. We're not to measure our church, this church against another church. Listen, if you're a believer in Christ and I'm a believer in Christ, then we're going to go to the same heaven. Amen? And if we believe the Bible and we preach the Bible, we're going to the same heaven. We trust Jesus Christ. If the church across town preaches the Bible and lives the Bible and their folks know Jesus Christ, they're going to the same heaven as well. And if the church in another state and the church on the other side of the world, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. But all that being said, we still don't measure ourselves against that standard. We measure ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as Paul wrote in the scripture, Romans chapter 8, 
we are seeking to be more and more conformed to the image of who? His Son, Jesus Christ. I like what theologian R.C. Swift said. He said, a worthy walk then means specifically the achievement of true Christian unity among themselves and steadfastness against the enemies of the gospel. What are we saying? You and I as Christians today should live a life that is befitting the name Christian. We should live a life that is becoming the name Christian. And sometimes, you know, we get involved in things and, and we get upset and we get angry and we say, well, why? And we'll say this to a believer. Why? Why are you so upset? And, and, and say, well, uh, uh, I, it's just my nature to be that way. Wait a minute. But that's when we have to stop and think. We can't live by the old nature. God has given us in Christ a new nature. It's the new nature we're to live out. It's the new nature that we're to exemplify, isn't it? And I need that message for myself. There's a lot of stuff out there. And that's what it is, is stuff. But there's a lot of stuff out there that can really get your feathers in a fluff, can it? And we have to be careful. We have to remember whose we are and who we're to represent 24-7. A church member asked her pastor. She said, Pastor, we have some, mem we have some neighbors who believe a false gospel. What literature would you recommend that I give them? The pastor opened his Bible to 2 Corinthians 3, 2. He read, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. He said to her, he said, the best literature in the world for them to read is your life. But you know what? If that is true, and I believe it is, the life that we live in Christ, that needs to be in Christ. Amen? We, they need to see Jesus in us. Bishop, a British bishop, John Taylor Smith, uh, he was a chaplain during World War I, and he was asked to preach at a Jubilee celebration in Chicago. And while he was crossing the Atlantic, he walked around on the promenade deck in the open air each day, and because he did in that weather, he lost his voice. So when he arrived in Chicago, he preached in a whisper with none of the modern electronic gadgets available for amplification. At the end of his address... Someone came to him and said, you have persuaded me that I must become a Christian. So the bishop asked them, they said, what exactly was it that I said that brought you to this point? The man answered, he said, Bishop, I couldn't hear a word you said. It was just looking at your life that drew me. Isn't that true? The life that we live for Christ Secondly, there is a cooperation that needs to be exhibited amongst us as believers. There's a cooperation. Paul uses an athletic term to describe how believers should live as Christians. He speaks of the unity that's important to the body of Christ. In fact, Paul goes on and he talks about some of us are arms, some of us are legs, some of us are ears, noses, mouth, eye. But we all work together. That body all works together. And this unity is to be demonstrated as a Christian. So in chapter number 1 that we're looking at, verse 27, Paul said, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. Now think about this for a moment. If Paul is talking about a cooperation that needs to be exhibited amongst us as believers then we note, first of all, that we are to be, we are to be an undivided people, undivided. As believers, we're to stand fast, he said, in one spirit and with one mind. And it's interesting in this passage here, stand fast with one spirit, with one mind, that the, the, this term, one mind, is literally, you could write in the margin of your Bible, literally means same soul. That means that believers share life. We share the life of Christ together. I don't get any more of the life of Christ than you do, and you don't get any more than the life of Christ than I do. We study. We might learn more because we're studying more, because we're in it more. But as Christians, as men and women in the faith, we share life together. That means as we share life, we're not to be characterized by divisions. 
We're not to be characterized by disunities. We're to be characterized as standing fast together, one mind, one soul, sharing the life that God has called us into. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 17, in verse 21, that they, Jesus prayed that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, I've read that verse so many times. And, and as I was studying and preparing, this jumped off at me. Why must they believe that we are one? Why must they see, as Jesus prayed, that all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you? Why? That, that, that they all may be one in us. He said that the world may believe that you sent me. What is it? Listen, if we are divisive, if we are fractured, if we're at one another's throats, if we're going for the spiritual juggler veins, if, if we're doing all that, the world is never going to believe that Christ is the answer for them. Because they'll look at us and say, wow, it, it didn't work for you. What makes me think it'll work for me? You see that? So that's where we talk, this old nature that we have, that's where that really has to be pushed in the background. And that new nature for God really must be allowed to shine. And this is what Paul is calling for. We're to be united in purpose. That's what Paul said in verse 27. Same, he said that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. As believers... We should not only stand together, but we should also strive together. Paul spoke of striving together, or this, this word striving means contending together for the faith of the gospel. What is that exactly? Listen, we have a common goal, the same purpose. We have the same cause, and we should be united around that goal. That is the faith of the gospel. Listen, it is in the harmony it is in the harmony, not the individualism that achieves God's purposes. This is not a one-man band. This is about us uniting together. There's no superhero of the faith that's going to lead the charge. It, we have one superhero. It, his name is Jesus, but we're to follow after him. The word strive is a word that describes a team. It's like a football team consisting of 11 men. It's not 11 men doing their own thing, but it's 11 men working together as a team. One man may be an all-star in that team, but he'll not win the game alone. Why? Because there's no I in the word team. Can you find that? I've taken team and I spelled it out that way and 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 I could not come up with a letter I. It's not there. Why? Because the team is needed. Even the all-star of the team needs men around him to block and to pass and to be the support structure. Can't do it on their own. Herman Ostry had a barn floor that was under 29 inches of water, almost three feet of water because of a rising creek. The Bruno Nebraska farmer invited a few friends to a barn raising. He needed to move his entire 17,000 pound barn to a new foundation more than 143 feet away. Now, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I think, I think a ton is 2,000 pounds. So this thing weighs almost nine ton, this barn. His son, Mike, devised a lattice work of steel tubing and nail, bolted and welded it on the inside and the outside of the barn. Hundreds of handles were attached to this tubing. After one practice lift, 344 volunteers slowly walked the barn up a slight incline, each supporting less than 50 pounds in just three minutes and laid the barn on its new foundation. Now think about that. Hey, Bernie, that's quite a feat. Nine tons 
143 feet, 344 individuals, and it took them three minutes to do it. What am I saying? The church of Jesus Christ can accomplish great things when we work together. The church of Jesus Christ will do nothing, be nothing, if we're divided, if we're broken, if we're fractured, if every man becomes the one-man team. Third and final thing is that there is conflict that will be experienced by each of us as believers. There's a certain Christian behavior to be seen in the conflicts of life. It's one thing to behave, and now listen, it's one thing to behave as a Christian when things are going well. It's another to behave as a Christian when things are going poorly. Have you ever experienced a time in your life when things were going poorly? Have you ever experienced a time when things were not so sterling at the moment? All been there. And Paul says something to us here. I think we, we need to focus on this. We need to learn this. Paul said in verse 28, he told us, and not be any way terrified by our adversaries. Now I read that and I read that and I read that. The word terrified here means to be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by your adversaries. Where's he going with this? Well, the word was used of a high-strung horse that spooks at every strange moment and sound. And so what Paul is describing here is a kind of behavior that ought to be established on our part when we face adversity in life. He tells us the reason to not be terrified. He says, first of all, that there's to be a public revealing of our faith. This is what he says in the same verse. Chapter 1, verse 28, Paul said, And not in any way be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you salvation, and that from God. In other words, how you and I believe under fire is evidence that the Lord has been working in our lives, and the Lord is continuing to work in our lives. I, I like what one theologian said. He said this, quote, the world will never believe what we say until they see what we believe. And that's even when we're under fire. That's even when the furnace has been turned up another seven times. Nothing catches the world's attention faster than to see how someone in the hour of adversity behaves. And when we live, think about this. When we live in a courageous manner, when we live in a virtuous manner, having great faith in God, it demonstrates something. It demonstrates that which we possess and that which possesses us, and that is the relationship that we have with Almighty God and Jesus Christ. And that's what we're to be demonstrating. That's what we're to be showing. That's what people need to be hearing. That's what people need to be seeing. It was the year 1555, Queen Mary, if you're familiar with your history, came to the throne of England. Over 300 believers, over 300 Christ followers were exited, executed under the orders of who they called Bloody Mary because of all the execution she did against Christians. Among them were two great servants of God, one by the name of Hugh Latimer, and the other one by the name of Nicholas Ridley. In your Bible studies, you might have read about these preachers sometime. The two preachers were bound to a post, and wood was piled high around them, and then they were set on fire. It was at that time, as the fire began to gain, that Mr. Latimer looked at Mr. Ridley and said, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace as I trust it shall never be put out. And I thought, give us that holy boldness and courage. Amen? There's also going to be a personal rewarding of our faith. Paul tells us here in the next verse, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Paul tells us that adversity is granted to us. What is he saying? Literally, by grace, this granting on behalf of Christ. In other words, it, it, God graces us to believe. God graces us to suffer on Christ's behalf. Hey, have you ever thought of this? In the way God allows us to believe, that's a gift of God. 
It starts with the relationship to Jesus Christ, that unspeakable gift and full of glory, Christ. But not only is it how we believe that's a grace of God, but we have to add into this. It's also how we suffer. We suffer on Christ's behalf, which is also a grace of God. It's a gift. And you know what God does in, in be giving us that gift, benefiting us with that gift? We, we get into a unique company. You read Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. You read through the Old Testament. You read of all these. You think of the life of the Lord Jesus, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, all who suffered for him. We are in unique company with all those who have gone on before us. Our brothers and sisters today around the globe in underground churches who are sacrificing, being sacrificed, giving their lives as we suffer, as we sacrifice, we are in company with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I remember first time I read about uh, the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I remember when that truth dawned on my life because he lost his life for the cause of Christ. And Bonhoeffer says this, he said, quote, when God calls a man, he bids him to come and die, end of quote. We don't think of it that way. We think that when God calls a man, when God calls that woman into service of God, everything's going to be hunky-dory, all's going to be well with our soul forever. And it doesn't always work that way. And yet Christ is still on the throne and can still be the focal point of our life. And who's writing about this? The man who in a very short while is going to be beheaded for his faith. I believe if we looked at the difficult times in this light, tribulation times in this light, I believe that if we looked at trials in this light, it would change the way we behave in them. We would no longer view them as a problem, a problem of which to grumble over. We'd no longer look at things as problems in which to gossip over. God hates grumbling. God hates gossiping. But instead, we would look at these things as a privilege in which to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're to be about. I'll suggest to you that this was the attitude and spirit of our founding, founding fathers some 245 years or more ago. This was that spirit. Before God, they had that conduct, that manner of living. Before God, they had that cooperation. Before God, they were ready to lay everything down on the line, yea, even their own lives, when conflict ensued. And it brought about freedom that you and I enjoy today. But how is that made possible? It's made possible by the very one who would speak into the hearts of these fathers and the very one who speaks in the heart today. You shall know the truth, Jesus Christ, and the truth shall make you free. As a believer in Christ, we're to be Christian which means Christ-like in our conduct, the manner of living. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we're to cooperate with what God wants to do in and through our life. Sometimes we don't always understand it, but we stand on it. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, even when conflicts come, the conduct, the cooperation, the conduct, Paul said, these are all come for the faith of the gospel. I think about that and I say, am I at that place where I want to strive for the faith of the gospel? I pray I am. Are you at that place? Will you say, I'm willing to strive for the faith of the gospel? As Paul indicated today, are we as a church at that place? Because at the end of the day, it's not going to be about how small we were or how big we got. It's about were you and I, were we faithful personally 
individually and collectively, were we faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what it's all about. God help us to be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we shared today what I believe you'd have us to, God, I pray that you'd bless to our hearts. I pray this morning that there's, if there's anyone here, man, woman, young person, who have yet to trust the Lord Jesus Christ to become a Christian, to become a Christ follower. Lord, that you would speak to their heart today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The Bible states that gospel of miniature, for God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. To be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, we need to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply stated, knowing for sure our sins are forgiven and heaven our home. Not because of what we do or because of what we've done, but because Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He paid our sin's debt. Rising again, conquering both death and the grave. And because he lives, faith and trust in his finished work, we can live also. If you're here this morning and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would love to speak with you after the end of the service. One of our men, if you're a man, one of our women, if you're a woman, we would love to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Answer your questions from the Bible, the Word of God. It would be our privilege. As we close out with prayer this morning, I like to read the prayers of people, that people write how God spoke to their heart. And there's a blogger that I follow. And this morning it was a prayer that was made. And we share it along with you as our prayer today. They pray, Dear God, we thank you for the freedom you have given to us and for the price that was paid by Jesus so that we could live free. We remember today the cost of it all. Help us to walk in the ways that you lead. We desire to follow your voice, to press in close and hear your heart for our nation. Father, forgive us for when we have gone our own way. Show us the path to a closer walk with you. Help us to live every day that you give with purpose and passion never forgetting the sacrifice of your son on our behalf. Help us to live our lives in a way that brings full honor and glory to you. Lord, bless those who have given and continue to give so sacrificially of their own lives so that we can continue to enjoy the freedoms in our nation today. Bless their families, protect them and their loved ones, provide for their needs, fill them with your strength and grace. Help us not to take our freedom for granted. May we always remember that the liberties we so freely enjoy cost others their very lives. Thank you that in this nation today, we are free to worship. We are free to pray. We are free, free to read your word. We are free to speak. We are free to share. For this, we are incredibly grateful. Yet we understand how quickly these freedoms can be taken away. Give us an increased awareness of the spiritual battle we're in. Help us stand strong in you for, you and for you and for your purposes. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what we face, you hold the final say. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you are strong. Thank you that you fight for us, and we are never alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week in the Lord.